hello everyone. Um, I'm Hannah Baker and I'm one of the directors at Cambridge Architectural Research and also a researcher at Cambridge Uni. I'm pleased to welcome you to our second online car showroom. Uh, for those of you that didn't come to the last one, Cambridge Architectural Research is an interdisciplinary uh, uh, company based in Cambridge and we conduct a range of research on topics to do with the built environment and we've also got practicing engineers in the structures team. Normally once a month we would welcome you to the offices, but instead due to the current uh, situation we're living in, uh, we'll welcome you virtually into our homes, although Tyrone is actually at the CA offices, so you get to have a little bit of a glimpse. Uh, the advantage of us going virtual today is we have over 60 people registered for this talk and listening in. So a quick bit of housekeeping before we start. The talk will be about 30 minutes and then we'll open up the floor to questions. If you think of any questions during the talk, please feel free to post it in the question and answer box and then we can ask it on your behalf. Or if you wait until the end of the talk, uh, there's an option to raise your hand and then we can switch on your video and your audio and then um, you can ask it yourself. And that's a lot more interactive. So if you could do that, that's preferred. Um, but just be aware that the webinar is being recorded, but this is only for archival purposes um, at the moment. Um, so helping with the questions and logistics of Zoom today is Natcha. Uh, she is a PhD student from the architecture department here in Cambridge and she's also set up this webinar and uh, has created the posters and also a quick thank you to Janet who has been in charge of the invites and organising our speakers and of course Tom Miller for agreeing to speak. So today Tyrone from our structures team and an executive and director at CAR will introduce Tom as the two of them have worked on a range of projects in the past. So now I'll, now I'll pass over to you, Tyrone. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Yes, um, my name is Tyrone Bowen. Um, I am a director here at CAR um, and I am working the structures team. And um, I've got the pleasure of introducing to you today um, the one and only Tom Miller. Um, who, um, as you all know, is a bit of like Cambridge royalty when it comes to architecture. So I'm looking forward to this talk. Okay, um, I'll tell you a bit about Tom. Um, some of it I've grabbed from their website. Some of it is pure sort of knowledge of the man himself. Um, some made up, presumably. And, and a bit of a best man speech as well. <laughs> so Tom studied architecture at the University of Cambridge and qualified in 1996 um, and started his career in North Wales at a small practice called David Lee Architects. Um, now this practice specializes in low energy design and the use of sustainable materials inspired by Scandinavian British tradition, similar to Tom, as you can see from his looks. Um, after some time in Wales and climbing hills, etc., he returned to Cambridge some years later <laughs> and he um, set up the practice with Paddy Ward and Rowan to um, form Hayton Ward Miller. And they, they're, as you all know, a fantastic group of architects, um, local architects, and um, very good designers. He has designed a number of award winning projects. Um, particularly in the education and residential sectors where budgets are usually very tight and you have to do it in half the time that you should really do it in. But yeah, that's his skill. He believes that good design can make a really positive impact on a young person's experience of education. And I personally have seen this firsthand working on a few projects with him. Um, but that is really what he thinks. So, I won't ramble on anymore. I'd like to just introduce you to the one and only Tom Miller. Over, over to you, Tom. Thank you, Tyrone. Uh, that's fantastic. I mean, you've basically delivered all my material, to be honest. Um, but I'll just recap for everyone's benefit um, as we go on. Uh, I'll quickly share my screen and uh, see if I can get my, my slides playing. Um, if I do that. And that. Right. Um, Natch, can you just confirm the screen is, is showing my first slide? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk this afternoon. Um, one of the real 
positives, I think, uh, such as there are positives to come out of, of lockdown, is the number of fantastic talks that um, are out there that we've been able to, to watch. And so if you live in the sticks like I do, it, it's, it's much easier actually to see really interesting people talk. And a couple of weeks ago, um, I was able to listen to Di Haig talking about Bailey Scott, uh, arts and crafts architect, about whom she obviously knows a huge amount. Um, and she was just pointing out that at the moment, with us all spending so much more time at home, um, some of his work is actually incredibly relevant. And in particular, she was talking about how, you know, 100 years ago, Bailey Scott was railing against conventional risk of a speculative housing and was arguing that, in fact, we can do much, much better by responding to the way that people actually live and taking joy in materials, the way that buildings are built. Um, we could make buildings that would be joyful and uplifting places in which to live. And she was talking about the alchemy of his work, magically making something special um, and valuable out of the everyday. And I thought that was an incredibly good point, especially about, about its relevance, because still a hundred years later, you know, we've, we've still got huge amounts of rubbish housing being built. Um, boxy rooms, uh, dark spaces, um, really conventional stuff that, in that it uh, owes to convention, it's, it's vastly outdated convention. And I think it's worth looking at some of the themes that were first explored with Bailey Scott, but other people have, have developed since that I think can go on um, informing how we design. So this is um, obviously uh, the garden and plan of 48 Stories Way. Um, and one of the themes, the first thing that I'll look at was the connection to outside. And this is something that Nick Baker talked about in his last talk as well, uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was talking about the, the measurable benefits to well-being of being able to see out from, from our buildings um, and that close linking between inside and outside. And um, this was something Bailey Scott obviously worked on a lot. Um, he designed his gardens and houses always as a piece and, and here at 48 Stories Way, sorry, uh, that was bound to happen. Um, here at 48 Stories Way, you know, you've got these main axes that drag right through the building, linking it with the garden uh, and down each side as well. And these are themes that come up again and again. Obviously, this is a very generous um, site by modern standards, but um, even in smaller houses, yeah, he was, he was looking at the same themes. And it's not something that only works on big sites. And this is a, a Japanese traditional townhouse. And here, you know, you've got essentially the whole site uh, is knitted together into internal and external spaces. It's actually quite hard looking at the plan to work out which is which, but every space has views out into garden or courtyard, um, spaces that, that can, can give pleasure. Um, and then pulling that into modern day, this is, is one of my great heroes. This is Peter Oldington at Turn End. This is the entrance court. But as you move through his own house, um, the way it works around a courtyard, um, the internal external spaces are, are treated absolutely equally as you know, essential parts of, of the composition. Um, that's his bedroom on the right behind that tree um, where he and Margaret, I think, have, have lived for oh, 50, 60 years now, um, just next to this beautiful garden. And a similar theme, I suppose a similar tradition. This is Johan Utzon, um, a competition scheme for a house that was done for um, a competition in Sweden, I think, in the 50s, um, where he started uh, investigating these ideas of building a walled plot and then roofing part of it. Um, so you've got this L-shaped roofed bit in one corner. But the courtyard garden is an absolutely integral part um, and every room obviously links with, with that, that space. Um, and again, that develops, and this is um, the development of that scheme, although that scheme was never built, he was, he was commissioned to build similar things in Denmark. Uh, this is Fredensborg, I think. Um, and the small courtyards are very much treated as rooms. Um, and then there are views out from those rooms into the shared uh, wider countryside. And this is another of the heroes, um, someone whom uh, Tyrone's already mentioned, this is David Lee. Uh, this was a scheme for housing for elderly people in Surrey, in Church. And David was obviously influenced by Jorn Utzon. And you have these, these L-shaped um, units on the, on the left, each one wrapping around its little courtyard, but then with views out into the communal space. Um, David is probably known to a lot of you. Uh, for those who don't know him, uh, he 
did a lot of work recently at the Centre for Attention Technology in McCutcliffe. Um, but earlier in his career, he worked with Sandy Wilson, then London Borough of uh, Merton with uh, Richmond Cormack, incredibly gifted designer, and someone with a really deep knowledge of construction, uh, of how buildings actually get put together. Something I think you perhaps only get from, from doing it yourself, just as the Oldingtons did at their house. Uh, here's the layout of one of those houses, a very really beautiful scheme. Um, David was very influenced by Japanese construction, but also by Walter Siegel. And uh, here you can see the sort of tartan grid of, of the Walter Siegel system, but um, developed in the Japanese way. And here you've got two people living in this house. It's a shared unit, a shared sitting room, individual bedrooms, and then wrapping around a little garden, and then the wider communal garden beyond. And David published this little um, study in the ARQ years and years and years ago. And it was about this idea of making a house by uh, essentially taking a walled garden or a walled plot and then just roofing over part of that garden and allowing the spaces then to, to become part of that garden. Um, and there's a secondary idea bottom right there about dividing up those spaces by using subsidiary elements, um, service spaces and so on, in boxes or cabinets to, uh, to subdivide the space. The second idea I'm going to touch on briefly, I haven't got many slides of this one, is the idea of progression or journey through a scheme, um, which I think can make a massive difference, even or perhaps even more in, in smaller schemes. Um, this is engraved by Eduardo Chilida, um, Basque architect and uh, sculptor and engraver. And certainly as an architect, it's very hard not to see this as a plan or a piece of townscape or urban, urban planning, um, and not to read the, the character of different spaces as you travel through them. Uh, routes and stopping points, um, places that widen out, different character and feel of each. Um, I think people who explore this uh, and celebrate this particularly are some of the Norwegian architects. I'm a big fan of Lundhagen over in, uh, in Norway, um, who are very fortunate in being commissioned regularly to do uh, these little holiday cottages that um, the Norwegians love to have. Um, and this is one of theirs. And it's a real celebration of the route to the house. And as you go on through their plans, um, there's often a sort of sequence of, of more and less covered spaces and then you know, the big reveal of some big view or something at the end. And it, taking in the landscape and celebrating those connections with the landscape beyond as you go through a building and building up to it through the route, um, obviously gives you so much more value out of that experience. The counterpoint to a progression through a scheme um, I suppose inevitably is to have points of rest. And um, this is obviously Bailey Scott. Um, the Arts and Crafts House, uh, in a lot of cases, was designed around this idea of the, the Great Hall, something that came down from sort of romanticized idea of, of medieval house planning. But within these larger spaces, um, he always made sure there were alcoves, corners, places where one could eat or read or sit by the fire. Um, and it's that change of scale that obviously makes them incredibly adaptable and useful places in which to live. Um, Di was pointing out how well adapted this is for a family stuck at home where everyone has different activities um, and, and is able to enjoy different little places. And it links with Nick's idea that he expressed in his last talk about the pleasure we get from living in spaces that are uh, in where we're able to adapt our, our conditions as we, as we wish. You know, we can go somewhere lighter, somewhere darker, somewhere more sheltered, somewhere more open. Um, as, as we feel through the day. Um, this is David Lee again. Uh, I remember David Lee once saying that there was a period in his career when, you know, despite being a modernist at heart, he'd been seduced by the arts and crafts. Um, and on the left here, he's sort of riffing on that whole idea of the settle and the fireplace, absolutely straight arts and crafts. Um, this was some early sketches for a scheme that developed rather differently for an artist's studio. Um, but that little corner with the bed and the settle and the fire is um, incredibly uh, enticing. And the two images on the right are of a, a little speculative scheme that, that David did. Um, living and working in North Wales, obviously the, the climate is not always as you'd wish. There are long periods, certainly through January and February, when it seems to never stop raining. And um, he designed this little house as a place that without being hugely expensive or taking up a huge amount of space um, would give really good indoor living spaces. It wasn't divided into little boxes. And um, I think it's an incredibly elegant plan. Um, you can see that essentially it's all arranged around 
a double height space, which obviously links back to the arts and crafts idea of a hall. Um, you've got this very neat little bedroom down one side, which really only manages to be big enough by tucking out through the wall. Um, so you get these little views out to each side. Um, a second bedroom, and then the kitchen and dining room are alcoves off that main living space. And uh, it's it's a tiny plan. It's I think it's just over sixty square meters um, as a three bedroom house. It's, it's quite astonishing, um, but very elegant. Again, very seductive. When I worked for David, the timber for this house was all cut and sitting in a barn, um, waiting for someone to want it. Um, and as far as I know, it never it never got used. It all got broken up and used for other things, which is a great shame. The third idea that Bailey Scott certainly uh, spent a huge amount of time thinking about was that of materiality. Um, it goes without saying that craft was an integral part of, of the arts and crafts, um, but it went beyond simply knowledge of, of making um, into obviously expression of, of the methods, the techniques that were involved and of the character of the various materials. Um, Voise explored this in his essay, Ideas and Things, Bailey Scott, in ideals in building on the art of building. Um, he talked about how, uh, you know, a, a piece of plaster, this is from Blackwell, um, should look as though it was once a soft, wet, pliable material. Um, and he and others wrote about how the different character of timbers would suit them to different, different finishes. You know, that a piece of oak is inherently difficult to work and there's nothing wrong with expressing that in the way it's finished, whereas something that can be finished more highly um, can express that different aspect of its character. Um, on the right, that's a, a bit of Japanese vernacular building, um, where that obsessive um, enjoyment of, of the different characters of different materials uh, is taken to a very high level. Um, and again, on the right hand side, that is an extraordinary Japanese detail, um, which in some ways denies the nature of the material, a piece of granite there beautifully scarfed to a piece of, of timber. Um, on the left, obviously there's leverance, being obsessed about never cutting a brick, um, but I mean, not quite fetishizing, but really expressing the nature of the material, the way it's made, the way it's assembled and put together. Um, and I think that has huge power to lend richness to our interiors. Um, it's obviously much harder now, craft has become more expensive, handmade materials have become more expensive, but I think it's still worth the effort. Um, fundamentally, no matter what shape or colour you make a plasterboard box, it's still a plasterboard box. Um, and perhaps even just a bit of uh, constructional or structural honesty is enough to give that same richness. Um, this obviously is Aldington again uh, at turn end, um, with this very limited palette of bare fair face block work and rough cast. But even the way the timber is used, you know, finer timber used for the joinery and rougher stuff for the cladding and the structure. It's all incredibly expressive about the way it's been put together. And as I said, you know, perhaps that's because Peter and Margaret actually did put it all together pretty much themselves. Um, I'll only talk very briefly about this because I haven't got good photos of it. This is a, a scheme that um, I worked on with David and it was a house called Blind Camel down in Mid Wales. And, um, what we had here was a, a traditional um, stone Welsh farmhouse, very much a house built about its interior, you know, thick walls, tiny windows, comfortable in its own way, but, but depressingly dark in winter. And the client wanted um, some spaces that were lighter and brighter and more comfortable. And so we, the kitchen was left in that space because that's where they wanted it. But we built this extension to, um, to give them new living spaces and uh, a guest room or office room and, and a bedroom. And basically we constructed um, big stone screening walls, which I suppose is sort of slightly messian in, in an approach, um, with a, you know, views out through, through gaps and the walls step down here, so there's a view out. But then across that, on the cross axis, the main house, uh, we built a modern green oak frame um, with the roofs running this way. And it's a, a sort of AB, ABA rhythm um, and structurally, um, it's, it's quite expressive. Those, those minor bays 
uh, are cross braced so that the main roofs that run the other way don't have to have any ties in them at all. All the loads are just pushed, pushed out sideways. Um, and then within that, picking up on the idea that you develop later in that ARQ drawing, the minor spaces are defined by those cabinets and boxes um, that sit within the, the main space. So uh, if I get rid of all those red lines, you've got a box here, which is literally an ash box sitting within the space. It's this one here on section, which has got the main bed in it. Um, and a screen can be drawn across to close it off. And you have another box here with utility things in, boiler and loo and so on. And those define the subdivision space. It was an exercise really in, in minimal embodied energy. That This was back in the mid nineties. Um, we had green oak that was felled on site. Um, we had stone that was quarried on site. Uh, the lime, walls were lime plastered on, on timber lath that was from timber on site. Uh, and even the walls were insulated with sheep's wool, which we, um, we trucked up to uh, Yorkshire on one of their vegetable delivery trucks um, to have um, converted. And then I thought I'd go from those general principles and talk a little bit how uh, those things come through in our own work. So this is Lockside House that some of you would have seen uh, up on the west coast of Scotland. And fundamentally, there's no point even trying to compete with that landscape. Um, it's, it's too grand, you can only hope to be a small part of it. But here we are, we're on the north side of a, a small bay. Um, that's the bay down bottom right, and we're looking south across it. And effectively, we have a central um, flat roof section through the middle of the house, which is the circulation entry at the west end. And then we have uh, a monopitch range on the north side, which is the serviced band, and a couple of pavilions on the other side, on the south side, here and here, um, which have a lot of the, the sort of living accommodation and bedrooms in. And the ground falls away slowly from the entrance. And so, but the roof runs through level. So as you, as you move down that spine of the building, uh, the ceiling is, is running a consistent height. The floor is slowly stepping down so that that route opens out. And, uh, and we've got a slight point of inflection where you can see that round roof line um, where you turn a little bit and take in a new view as you move down that route. So it's all about setting up that progression through the building and, and celebrating it, which makes what's actually quite a small building um, feel rather bigger. So here's the plan, and you can see there on the north side, the service band under a monopitch, um, the spine running through the middle from the entrance canopy down to where it inflects under that roof light, and then on to uh, step down a bit further for the main bedroom sitting in the grandest spaces. So here's that entrance, which is really quite tight. I mean, this is a quite a wild landscape here. Um, the wind rattles out of the west, and although we've got a few sheltering trees, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, so that sense of enclosure feels right. And then as you move through the house, um, the space is open out on each side and this is the main living space which is opening out, um, both as the floor steps down and as the roof, roofs climb up to each side. Um, and a little bit of celebration material. I mean, here's that, that classic arts and crafts set piece of the fire and settle and so on. Um, but you can see the flat ceiling of the circulation uh, running down the middle and this stack of painted brickwork, which is the only lump of masonry in the house, um, which obviously forms the that central vertical axis of the, of the fire and chimney stack. And then on the north side, the character is very different under that monopitch, where you have a, a scattering of windows that you view out into the trees. Um, just accepting and celebrating that, the very different character of the two sides of the house. And obviously this is a relatively big house compared with most of what gets built. Um, and it's a, a stunning sight. But I think those same games can, can form um, really quite ordinary houses. Um, the next one is a, an infill plot in Cambridge. This is down in Derwent Close. And our site was that bit of close border fencing on the, on the right, um, overlooked by all existing houses. Um, just a you know, very everyday bit of, bit of land. And our first move there was essentially to turn it into a walled garden. Um, so we, we built these brick walls around the perimeter. And then 
Um, actually, uh, I've got a better slide. Um, oh, I'll go through it. Um, yes, I'm going to go back because I think I've got better drawings. Um, then we dropped a roof essentially over part of this site, just sitting on top of the walls. And finally, we put in a root, a spine that ran through the middle, so that from entrance, so that spine. And the idea was then that spine forms a series of relationships with the spaces off to each side of it, both the garden and the main rooms. So uh, the larger shape there is, is, I suppose, what it would map to the traditional hall in the, the Arts and Crafts house um, with these alcoves around it, um, which are the subsidiary spaces. So there's the plan as it actually ends up with our central spine running through the middle, linking the main entrance with the back entrance into a courtyard. Uh, to the south of it, we've got the main space and then a series of alcoves around that and views out in turn um, to building you know, spaces of, of different scales as you, as you move along that spine. And here it is from the street, um, really you know, very quiet. Um, I think it's, it's, it's about materials rather than, um, rather than making a big play. It's accepting that sometimes um, the key point is to contribute to the streetscape rather than necessarily to, to make a big, a big scene. Inside, this is the, the main space um, with the kitchen and hall and so on, as our kind of off in. And then this is the bedroom looking out into the courtyard, trying to achieve views out into the gardens from every space. And in its own limited way, attention to materials. Budget wasn't there for expensive stuff. I'd love for these external walls to have been painted brick, but we just couldn't do it. But even so, we took care over the plaster. Um, uh, we used a slightly gritty mix that um, you could rub up a little bit, the sponge float as it started to go off. We thought about transition of floor materials from uh, exposed aggregate concrete at the entrances through to polished concrete as you got into it. And even quite a cheap brick, but thinking carefully about pointing and so on. And this is um, obviously not a house, you know, another of our buildings, just a school, but obviously very tight budget, very fast program. But even there, I feel that the expression of structure um, limited palette materials can give it a richness and legibility and scale. So this is Coleridge Community College down in the south of Cambridge. Um, with spin cast concrete columns, um, steel work, which I, I wanted to capture some of the, the feeling of those big riveted railway bridges. Um, so you know, big joints, bare brick and a CLT and timber roof. Now, at first glance, it, it may seem difficult to think so much about materials and journey and so on, um, while at the same time dealing with the sustainability challenge that we all face. Um, the passive house approach is in some ways you know, oversimplified, but it's to isolate the internal environment from the outside. And as Nick was pointing out, that can make the internal environment anodyne unsimulating, but is doing anything else an unaffordable luxury or indulgence? And I'd like to think not. Um, I'd like to think there's still a place for thinking about design of, of houses in this way, even while trying to meet those, those bigger responsibilities. Uh, I've got a couple of images here of our own house. And we bought a tiny flint cottage, um, Suffolk countryside, um, which we wanted to reuse, save those materials. Um, but we want to differentiate our additions, which include that bit you can see behind um, from, from the flint cottage. Um, but the result was a very bad form factor, which obviously is, is not ideal for, for energy use. Um, this is the plan, and bottom left, this is the original Flint Cottage. Um, and then we added this great long room running along the back, and then a two-storey element at this end, um, with a single-storey linking piece in between. And to a certain extent, the building is all about the journey. It's that progression again, coming in on the north side into the relatively dark um, cottage, 
and then rising up and really enjoying climbing out into this brighter space with big views out over the countryside beyond. And that meant a compromise on solar gain, thermal loss, you know, having so much glass. The best will in the world, we wanted to express the flint of the original cottage and sealing to a flint wall is virtually impossible. The wind comes through it, so there's a slight cost in air tightness. Um, and we were very aware of, of those compromises. Um, the journey actually continues on upstairs at this end. You have this sort of spiral climbing up around the brick chimney stack up to the main bedroom. And there's a, a progression up this way to the views out west from a sort of music room at the west end. And there's that moment when you climb up through the dark cottage and merge out into the extension and you get these sudden views out um, into, into the countryside. And so I was interested to know to what extent they, these compromises, yeah, that are, that are design led and our indulgences um, are uh, compatible with those, those sustainability ideas. Uh, gives you an idea of how the cottage sits against the extension. We did try to get the basics right. Um, because we wanted to express the flint of the cottage, we ended up doing a, an insulated box essentially within the cottage. But in order to keep the continuous insulation um, around the extension, we actually ended up insulating the outside of the extension. And so there's never to be a bit of a problem at that connection. Um, but we did the basics, we triple glazed, we put in a heat pump, we put in MVHR. And for the last couple of years, I've been following the data uh, and we've got metering on the heat pump um, and our PVs and our overall electricity. And actually, encouragingly, that's, that's the energy use of this building, bottom left, um, which shows we're pretty much hitting the Reba 2030 target, even with those compromises. And um, I find that actually incredibly encouraging that we can still think about um, you know, the, the architecture, the design side of it, and still achieve decent thermal performance. Um, and keep the existing building and deal with the embodied energy aspects, obviously, the advantage of doing that. Um, and so I think that's that's really positive. But it does mean that you know, we've got no, ex no excuse for, for not thinking about, about the basics. Um, now, I, I titled this The Modest House. And I suppose I was thinking of modest in two, two ways, both um, modest in the sense of understated, um, and not being profligate. Um, understated, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a Nordic tradition of, I think they call it Jantelard, you know, um, that the, the individual is slightly less important than the community, um, which could be uh, a criticism, a tendency of the conservatism to sort of stifle the individualism. But I think it's okay for houses to be modest. Um, you know, in that landscape, an outside house, uh, there's no way you compete with that. You are only part of the landscape. And in our towns, the houses are just mostly the background stuff um, that makes the streetscape, the townscape, the landscape. Um, but at the same time, um, we obviously need to not be profligate in our use of materials, modest in that sense. Um, we need to get the basics right. And I think it's there is joy to be had in designing buildings that are efficient and simple, but get the basics right. Um, and they can be beautiful in doing that. And I think that's, that's all I really wanted to say. <laughs>